Hello, farmers, and welcome to another episode of The Harvest Season. My name is Al. And my name is Johnny. And we're here today to talk about farming games. Welcome, Johnny. First podcast. It's good to have you. It is good to be here. Uh, So Johnny is, uh, uh, I guess, another one of the friends from the Pokemon community that uh, many of us are from. Um, And uh, I saw that Johnny was enjoying playing Disney Dreamlight Valley, which is rare for Johnny to enjoy playing a game. Uh, <laughs> and I that is true. I, I, I enjoy hating on games way more than I enjoy playing games. <laughs> it's easy. It's easy to hate on games, right? That's the problem. It is. It is. And I had been considering playing it because people seem to really like the game. And I was like, well, you know what? Let's cover it. So I approached Johnny and, and that's why you're here. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And I, I'm super excited to be here to talk about uh, Dreamlight Valley uh, as a little bit of a spoiler for what we'll get into, but I was not expecting to enjoy this game as much as I as much as I have. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- this is a game that should be bad, but somehow is not, and I I, I don't understand it. <laughs> yep, that is that is the main takeaway. <laughs> if you take nothing else from this episode, is that it should be bad, and somehow it is absolutely uh not. Uh, yeah, so we're, that's going to be our main topic for the episode. Um, uh, before that, we're going to talk about some news. Um, but first of all, Johnny, what have you been playing? What have I been playing? I've been playing a lot of Tim Tim. Um, mm. And uh, I guess just in case people don't know, Tim Tim is like the Pokemon MMO clone that was kickstarted. Uh, I probably hate to think how long ago, and I didn't kickstart it. <laughs> um, but I, I played it when it first went into early access, and my takeaway from the game in early access is that I thought it was really boring. Um, but mm. when I heard that it had, you know, fully come out, uh, I decided to give it another go, and they've turned that game around massively, and it is very fun. And I think for me, it's become a really good indicator of the the argument that people make poorly when they talk about Pokemon games and what they don't like when they say, ah, oh, Pokemon's for children, you know, um, and mm. it's kind of that that slightly... Um, you know, argument where you're talking down to people that are Pokemon fans. But for yeah. me, Tim Tim is like, it's a hard Pokemon game. It's kind of just hitting all the right boxes. I don't know about the MMO stuff. I haven't got to that point. But um, as kind of like a good hard Pokemon clone, it is really ticking a lot of those boxes for me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I, I might be misremembering, but I feel like it was like kickstarted around the few months before Sword and Shield came out, like around that whole thing. Um, so that would have been yeah, like, I think that sounds right. Ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds about right. It was, um, and, and it got a lot of hype, right? Because it did, um, yeah. I, I think part of the reason it got hype was maybe because of all the Dexit stuff that was going, uh, yeah. going on, and people maybe feeling a little bit less invested in Pokemon, but um, mm. uh. Yeah, I, I think Tim Tim is doing some stuff well, and I and I think there is some things that you can achieve uh, when you're not target you're explicitly not targeting a game at children, right? Like yeah. within the story, they go places that a Pokemon story would never go. I don't know that they go there particularly well, uh, or in a way that's particularly <laughs> engaging. Um, but even just fun things, right? It's like when you're interacting with the bad guy team, um, and they give you dialogue options. One of the options is always just to say. Uh, the Belostos is the, is the name of the bad guy team, and you can always just say Belostos eat poop as a response to everything, right? Which is it's and it's just kind of like uh, dumb fun um, with just surprisingly hard battles. But it feels like a lot of the time when I'm losing, I'm losing because uh, I'm not that good at Tim Tim or competitive Pokemon, um, yeah. rather than you know just massively over leveled. Um, uh, opposing things although there is occasionally a bit of that interesting yeah i've i've been vaguely i've been vaguely interested in temtem i haven't played it and i'll tell you the reason i haven't played it is because i don't have an issue with the mmo stuff and i think that like i'm really glad that something like that exists for people but my issue is the requirement to be like online all times because to me like that strikes me as something that at some point you've got this small games company that uh we don't know what's going to happen with them right like they could be fine and they could survive for like 10 20 years and that's fine or they could be dead in a year and their server goes down and you now can't play the game anymore like that to me is an odd thing and i don't think i want to kind of put any time into a game that like could shut down at any moment 
Yeah, I like. I totally understand where people are coming from if that's their opinion, but um, I guess for me, I don't typically tend to go back and play games that much after getting my yeah. initial bit out, and um, I kind of enjoy the MMO bit. Like, it is really nice just to run around the world and see, you know, other people with other, uh, you know, Temtem that you haven't seen before, and you can add them to your, um, to whatever they call a Pokedex um, yeah. by just sort of walking up and interacting with it. So I think that stuff is is cool. Um, Absolutely. I'm interested to... S- I'm interested to see how it holds up against uh, what uh, Scarlet and Violet is going to try and do, right? Because I feel like they're mm. going to push into very similar areas. Yeah, I think the thing is that I, I, I too think it's really interesting, and I'm not saying I wouldn't use the MMO aspects of it. I mean, that actually is really interesting. As bad as like Sword and Shield did that, sort of like you're playing with other people, it was still really nice to be able to turn on the internet and see other people in the wild area. But my issue is more... Like, literally, they could turn off the servers tomorrow when I can't play the game. And, like, I, I don't understand why it isn't an option to be able to play it offline. Like, it just feels like such a basic thing. Like, it, it's not a fun... It's not like with, you know, say, like, with Pokemon Go. That is literally an online game, right? Like, and, yeah, they could do the same thing with that. They could turn that off tomorrow, and I would be really angry if they did that. But, like, that game doesn't make any sense without the internet. Whereas, to me, and obviously I haven't played it, but it sounds like the game would work offline they just haven't enabled that oh a hundred percent the like i have not interacted with any of the mmo elements um and i my sense is that you don't need to to progress through the main story mm. and, I, and i think that's totally fair criticism right is that you should be able to play through that story in an offline mode if that's what you uh yeah. if that's what you want to do uh, i think the other appeal because i don't know how widely they've publicized this but i think it's a a huge appeal for a lot of people is you can play through the story co-op uh, because all mm. of the battles are double battles so mm-hmm. if you've got someone that's like you know maybe interested in a pokemon-esque thing um but you know they just like because you know people playing games co-op has become a lot more popular this might be a um a good way to start although it will be mm. you know <laughs> anyone that plays through the story co-op will then jump into any pokemon game and they will uh they will find it really easy <laughs> by comparison <laughs> yeah the co-op the co-op stuff does sound fun like i loved um you know the the co-op aspects of let's go pikachu and eevee that was really fun being able to just like have a second person playing along that does sound really good i i just i think it's going to be really funny there will be a point where they want to turn off the old game and they will have complaints because they'll be doing the same thing that they complained that pokemon did uh that's just going to be really funny but i guess we'll see what happens it feels like they're setting themselves up to fail (laughs) Yeah, honestly, it would not surprise me. And and I look at a lot of their post-game stuff around um, breeding and all that sort of stuff, and, and honestly, mm. it looks miserable um, compared to the direction <laughs> that Pokemon's taken things and just making things yeah. way easier. Uh, that, that yeah. somehow managed to make breeding more complicated. Uh, <laughs> wow. So that, yeah. that, if, you're, if you're into it for the competitive, it sounds like just stick with Pokemon. Well, this is the thing. Like, I don't, I don't play Pokemon games after the story because, like, I like the games. I, I, I play them afterwards because I, I want to get more shiny Pokemon, right? Like, I've invested like twenty five years of my life into these games. <laughs> like, I wouldn't do this for most games. Um, I'm not going to. So you're saying you them. don't want to pick up another game that's going to have, you know, that's like back to original shiny hunting odds, and you're not going to find that enjoyable. Uh, n- no. No, I mean, I, like, I don't, I don't play Pokemon games because of the shinies, right? Like, if if shinies didn't exist in Pokemon games, I would still play them. I just wouldn't put as much time into them after the post game. That's that's all. Like, what would I be doing otherwise? Like, the raids and stuff in Sword and Shield were fun, but they still have limited value. And like, we got to the point where I was really only jumping in maybe once every two or three months when there was a new raid event. And why would I do that? Because there was a new shiny that I could get from them. You know, like it's it's not. You have to have that reason for it, and it there aren't many games that an individual can keep doing that for um it's like the same with like you know these ongoing live service games like i sink so much time into pokemon go that could be a different game i could be like i it used to be ingress before pokemon go came out as soon as pokemon go came out i haven't touched ingress because i can't i don't have the time to play that game multiple times it just doesn't work that way there's only so much time especially an adult with kids can do well and and even just in the the modern world right where it's like 
uh, yeah. the opportunity cost of your time is so much clearer, right? I mean, I look at it at the moment when mm. you've got Rings of Power and House of the Dragon coming out, and it's just like, I don't have the brain space to mm-hmm. consume both of these bits of media at the same time, so I have to pick one over the other um, yeah. to to watch and it's just like th- those choices are way more explicit now for um for games and i think you know that is one of the problems that tim tim will face is like it's a really good game it's a really well designed game but even just breaking the the 25 years of mindset that pokemon has built up in most of us it's really hard right a lot of the the yeah. difficulty of the game comes from oh in pokemon that would have been a super effective move and here it's not for reasons yeah. that my brain can't fully comprehend <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What is actually fun about games? That's the question. <laughs> Nothing. Games are not fun. Complaining about games, that's where the fun is. I did not expect to have a 10 minute conversation about Temtem, but there we are. Uh, uh, I guess what I've been playing is uh, mostly just uh, Disney Dreamlight Valley, obviously. Um, but um, I've been playing some more Trombone Champ. So that is a game that is not getting old. I keep uh, continuing to enjoy it. So Nice. What's the in what's fact, the what's the elevator pitch for tr- Trombone Champ? I I saw this in the show notes and was just like, I I don't understand. Like a game's just random words now stapled together, and we just say, <laughs> yep, that's what we're going with. It's basically a um, an a rhythm game. It's like Guitar Hero but trombone. Okay. And it's really hard to explain. I think you need to watch. Like, there's plenty of videos of people playing it on Twitter. And I think that until you watch one or play it yourself, I don't think you can quite get how hilarious how hilarious it is. I just like, now have this uh, mental image of like you holding what I assume is like an old, you know, PlayStation, <laughs> um, one of the wands from a VR headset, but you're holding it up to your mouth and pressing <laughs> pressing buttons. And I don't know that I want to like no. remove that mental image, so I think I'm just not going to watch any videos of this and assume that that's what's happening. <laughs> I do, I do think a VR version of it would be really fun, and you've got to think someone <laughs> in the company is 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 looking into how much work it would be. Um, I do know that they are looking at uh, like physical accessories for this, um, because currently it's just like you play with your mouse and keyboard, or just or mouse or keyboard. Um, but I've actually been playing it on the Steam Deck using the gyroscope, which is good fun. So like up to go up and down to go down. Um, so I, I, yeah, it's it's hilarious and fun. And yes, a VR one would be ridiculous. This does just make me think that like VR um, rock band would be kind of amazing, right? Like, yeah, you know, you can physically be on a stage playing your instrument. You can look around, you know, yeah. do it co-op and see other people playing other instruments. That sounds that sounds sweet. Yeah, yeah, it does. Sadly, I feel like probably the world's moved past Guitar Hero and Rock Band today and into other things i i feel like there's been enough time that we could bring those back and and people would go crazy for it i don't know guitar hero tried that a few years ago with guitar hero live and it didn't really work yeah maybe they missed the boat with all of the lockdowns because i feel like that was a, a thing that people would have it's gone be- crazy for that, yeah. when you were stuck in your house i really liked guitar hero live but the problem is i had it on the wii u so yeah, I mean, I, I say all of this. I was never a Guitar Hero fan because I have no rhythm whatsoever. So I was always terrible. I could barely get through a song on easy. So um, I'm just more excited to see the crazy things that other people can do with those sorts of games. I was one of those people that, so I, I play guitar in real life. And so I was one of those people that looked at Guitar Hero and went, oh, that's nothing like playing a guitar. Why would you even do this? And then I actually tried it and I was like, oh, it's fun. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Why would I do this? Because it's fun. Turns out yeah. that is... That is video yeah. games. We worked so it now, out. Now, and now I own all of the Guitar Hero games. So, you know, oops. Amazing. <laughs> cool. So uh, let's talk about some news. First of all, um, so Akka, this is the game where you are playing as... Oh, what is the creature that you're playing as? Um, it's like a raccoon, I think. I need to double check. I should have double checked this before. Um, it's, it, I mean, the important thing is, is the game where there's a massive giant cap, uh, there's a giant capybara that you can sleep on. So, you know, that's really all you need to know. Oh, you're a red panda. That's what you are. Um, oh my God. Okay. I, I, I'm now like interested in this game because red pandas are super cute. It, it, it's a really good looking game in my opinion. Um, and I, I'm very much looking forward to it. I feel like I backed this one on Kickstarter. Um, so We'll see what happens, but uh, oh, yeah, the... okay. this, this this panda is so cute. I am I am into this. Yeah, 
Have you seen this, the, the, the sleeping giant capybara yet? I have not. It's just further down on the Steam page. Oh my god, okay, yeah. I, th- this, this is the sort of game, like, this is, this is the direction that games need to go, right? It's just find something super cute, go yeah. fully into it, invest in the art style, like, I'm all about this. I also feel like this game has, just based on what we see on the Steam page, I feel like it has some subtle humour, but also some things that will probably hit you right in the feels, and that is kind of like my sweet spot for a game. Oh, I'm right there with you, right? Um, like, when I when I hear that sort of vibe, I think of games like A Short Little Hike. Um, mm, is that yeah, what that yeah. was called? Um, a but short yeah, anyway, hike, yeah. like, th- those... Yeah, those, those games just that, that get that slight little emotional thing. They're relatable, great art style, easy to play, like all about those sorts of games. Yeah, so yeah, sad to hear that this is delayed because it looks... Yeah, looks so that's so, so that's news. Uh, so it's delayed. Uh, <laughs> um, they were me- It was meant to come out in September, and obviously it hasn't. Um, they're currently planning to release by the end of the year. I mean, yeah, sure, that's technically a delay, but like if it comes out in December rather than September, I'm not really going to complain. Um, but they have said there's a possibility they might need to delay till next year. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, a few months is a few months. Get your game good. I, I want to play it. So, uh, the early access is r- out for Coral Island. Um, so this is your uh, your standard. Uh, it's Stardew Valley, but on a tropical island. Uh. Yeah, it's kind of like one of those. Uh, I looked at the trailer, and I have to say. I'm excited. I felt like it was, it it was too Stardew Valley, right? Mm. Like, it, it's it's one of the uh, things I feel like I'm seeing more and more with farming games, and uh, I probably first felt it with um, uh, Story of Seasons: Pioneers of Olive Town, where it was like, yeah, they picked up a lot of really good things from Stardew, but it kind of almost felt like these games are sort of becoming indistinct from stardew they have a slightly different mm. art style or whatever but when you watch the trailer and you see the exact same fishing mini game from stardew it's like Ugh, that, that is not yeah. one of the strong points of stardew so you don't want to just no. copy and paste everything right yeah it is it's an interesting point um and i, I you know i was actually thinking back to pioneers of all of town because obviously i think in my review of it i was pretty positive about it but now thinking back i haven't played it since that episode um so i obviously wasn't that into it you know like for me not to have played a game in was it last year was it 2021 uh yeah i think so that's so 18 months i haven't played that game for that that doesn't that that doesn't strike me as a vote of confidence you know no no and i think that that was exactly my experience with that game as well right where you start playing and it feels good because it ticks all of the boxes that you expect uh a farming game to tick but at some point if there's not the unique thing that they're doing then uh like why am i here this this isn't going to you know yeah justify its spot for for me to play when there's so many great games coming out yeah yeah i mean i, I possibly coral island will, I, I will be like that as well i, I really like the gr- the look of it especially the um the the portraits um during conversation i can't remember what the name for that is um those look really good and i feel like the characters um have like a lot of character (laughs) a lot of personality to them um which i'm hoping is a good part of it um because that was kind of one thing that can really keep you in a game is like oh well i'm going to replay it because i want to get to know this person marry them or whatever um but yeah i mean it's possible it just ends up being like that but i certainly like when i think back to pioneers of olive town i can't remember any of the characters in that game no they all blended together right and maybe that is what the distinct thing for this game is because looking through the portraits like yeah these characters are all very attractive um i'm I'm into the art style like and the they they look like well-designed characters so maybe maybe this is more going down the the dating sim aspect yeah and the thing that i really like about this is not only are they all um they all look quite varied and yeah as you say attractive um but they're, they're quite varied and diverse as well we've got reasonable yes. it's not the most diverse i'm sure they could do better but you've got reasonable kind of spread of different ethnicities and also body types which is a, a huge thing that is missing in a lot of a lot of games oh totally it's um it's good to see more of that coming through like when was the last time you saw a game with a character with stretch marks <laughs> you know? well like. so so i have a i have a friend that works with game and they worked on a, a dating sim um uh, it was a dog-based dating sim, and that had a very diverse range of characters that you could um, that you could date. So um, 
I've seen some I'm of it, so- and I'm trying to remember the game, the name of that game, and I can't remember, which is really bad. But <laughs> I'm sorry, a dog-based dating sim. Oh uh, yeah, so, so so the idea is that you have a dog, and then you meet other people with dogs, and your dogs become friends, and then you also date right. the people with dogs. Okay, I see. I was like, you're dating. Yeah, co- dogs? context is very important there. <laughs> uh. Um, so Coral Island have also published their roadmap for early access. Um, so they have a number of uh, different updates that are upcoming. Um, they have kind of, I think, I, they've not kind of got like a timeline for it. They've just got, I, I got a bit confused because some, well, like one of them is like spring content update. And I'm like, is that a content update coming out in spring or a content update about spring? I think it's about spring. I don't think they're saying it's coming out in spring. Oh, my reading of that is that it, it was coming in spring. But no, now looking at it, you're right. You're right. Because I've got spring, uh, summer, then merfolk. So um, I'm not yeah. sure what time of year is merfolk, but. Um... <laughs> it's the hidden fifth season. Um, <laughs> I suspect the 1.0 update will probably come out in what we 20, 20, end of 2024 or beginning of 2025, but we'll see. Uh, the other thing is I, I asked them about controller support because they don't currently have controller support, but uh, it's also not on the roadmap. Um, and they've said it's, it is coming, but they've not explicitly said which update is coming in. So they've said one of the earlier updates. Doraemon, Story of Seasons, Friends of the Great Kingdom. Hey, I'm remembering the name. The demo for this game is out in Japan. I think that's it. There's not much more to say about that. It's not out here yet. Uh, here being, well, everywhere other than Japan. Once Japan works out the internet, I'm sure we'll get it. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember whether they've explicitly said it's coming else elsewhere. I think they did say it's coming, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's coming here. Uh, well, we'll see what happens. Um, we've only got three weeks, I think, till it comes out. Yeah, three yeah, weeks. Yeah, and localization well, for demos has got to be a lot of work that's maybe not the most valuable. Yeah, I mean, so localization. I was a bit, I was really hopeful when they announced that this was coming out at the same time everywhere. And then they announced that A Wonderful Life is coming out here six months after it comes out in Japan. And I was really confused. I'm like, are you, like, why? It felt like you were getting there. It felt like you were going, no, this is an important thing. We want to do global releases. Oh, but we're not going to do that anymore. Like, literally one game. It seems weird. Of all the games that you would choose to be a global release, why Doraemon as well? Yeah, it's it's an interesting choice, right? Because it's not the one that I would think has, you know, it hasn't sort of crossed that uh, cultural divide to have the mass market appeal. No. Um, or at least not not in the circles that, that I'm in. I don't feel like people are <laughs> particularly excited about Doraemon, so... Um, yeah there's a niche kind of farming game world where people are excited about it because they liked the first one um but certainly with like the first one i was like oh this is weird i'm gonna try this i guess um but now that obviously we played the first one i'm like well i'm obviously going to play the second one i really love the first one did you play this one johnny i feel like i played uh, maybe they did a demo for the the first one yeah. yeah so i feel like i played the demo and it just didn't grab me um but if i remember right that was a lot like a lot of the um stardew valley multiplayer stuff was happening around that time so a lot of Mm. people that i knew were getting back into stardew and we were redoing farms and and maybe like 1.4 and 1.5 were coming out so um yeah i feel like it kind of just got lost in that that sort of mad flurry of re-excitement about stardew valley yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. I think this game did some, a couple of things that I really loved about it that were kind of unique to this game. Um, and one of one of course is the graphics. It's like it has graphics like no other farming game I've played. Um, but secondly, the just the way that you farm just felt so comfy. Like I, I'm not saying that all farming games should do this, but like the the way that like the watering worked is it, it, you know how in most farming games you. You plant and then you water and then you go to sleep and in the morning it's grown a little bit. Um, in this one, the growing happens when you water it. So you like literally water the plant and you see it grow. And like that, it was just so pleasing to see that happen. And like the animation was so nice that it was just like a really good part of that game. And like it's something that no other farming game I've seen has done. And I think it's really hard to do well. Like it certainly wouldn't work in Stardew because the graphics just wouldn't kind of handle that. So you kind of get that like instant gratification aspect of... Yeah. This very long protracted process. Exactly. 
And it, it obviously makes no sense. Like, that's not something that would happen in real life. But as I've mentioned before, I don't play games to do real life. Yeah, no, that, that does sound nice, right? That you can see the the plant has moved along to the next uh, the next stage. Because that, that is yeah. something I feel like sometimes when people start farming games, it's a little bit um, hard, right? When it's like two or three days and the plants mm. haven't really changed much. And you wonder yeah. like, oh, am I, am I doing this right? You know, is there something mm-hmm. that I've missed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other fun thing about Doraemon was the fact that they use a lot of the kind of Doraemon style things from the show where he has like a bunch of gadgets, like that's his thing. And so they have like loads of gadgets that you kind of unlock through the game, um, which give you kind of, you know, automation stuff and like fast travel and stuff like that. That just made it fun. It gave it a lot more kind of personality than a lot of farming games. Lonesome Village, uh, we now have a release date. Uh, it's coming out on the 1st of November t- on PC, Switch, and Xbox. So this is the... Not a fox. It's not a fox. It is a... I have forgotten rac- the name. Oh, no, it's not a raccoon. What is What is he? He is a fox, Kevin, right? Kevin I'm, Kevin, I'm so sorry. It's not a fox. <laughs> uh, I say I'm sorry because it's quite a common uh, animal in Mexico. And the developers... Coyote! It's a Coyote! That sounds like a fox. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're they're very uh, similar. They're very similar, but not the same. This game looks um, um uh really cute and like uh I think before when I was talking about Coral Island and and you know kind of feeling like it needed something unique, I had sort of similarish vibes um about this until ve- towards the very end of the trailer when they you know reveal sort of the I don't know if it's a tower or quite what with all of the puzzles and. That was the one mm. thing that I needed to be like, yep, this is definitely a game that I will play. This looks um, this looks great. I'm really excited for this. Yeah, so it's kind of it's mash it's kind of a classic thing to do in video games just now, right? Is you take two old video games that people like and smash them together. So it's doing the same yep. thing with like, you know, Stardew Valley and Zelda and kind of or two D Zeldas and smashing them together. But like the puzzles seem a lot kind of more uh, kind of intricate. Um they're not just uh, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to get get at, but yeah, like yeah, the, the... in the trailer they show one of those light puzzles, right, where you're moving mirrors or something to bounce lights, and those puzzles are usually kind of uh, have a surprising amount of depth to them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I I, I backed this one as well, so I'm looking forward to to getting it um, co- coming out in only a few weeks. Although November first, right? Like, uh, it's bad. I was for I noticed. <laughs> It noticed that, so on the 1st of November, we have Lonesome Village coming out. On the 2nd of November, we have Doraemon Story of Seasons coming out. And on the 4th of November, we have Harvestella coming out. So that's four days. We have three big games coming out. Oh, I forgot about Harvestella. Did you try the demo I, for that? I did, and I don't think I'm going to play that game. It feels, it feels very much like it's Rune Factory 5, but with a slightly different story and and that mm. kind of but it also feels quite sparse the village um and from what i could tell like the people didn't really seem to have much personality now maybe that's unfair maybe i needed to play it for longer blah 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 but as we've discussed time is short games are many <laughs> you know yeah and if nothing's grabbing you because i feel like the the thing that seemed interesting about it is having an additional season um, but the way that was pitched in that game did not make me... I, I, I'm excited for that concept and for other people to steal that concept and to do something with it, but I don't know that I'm excited <laughs> for this implementation of it. I love that. I like what they, I like the idea they've done. I look forward to someone doing it better. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it feels like a gimmick to me. Like, it also feels like something that would be really annoying in that, that I get from the story that the extra season is like a thing that has happened because of some evil in the world and the point of the game is to get rid of that evil so the question is when that happens does this season of death stop happening which it should do because you've gotten rid of the evil um or does it do the like the zelda thing of oh it doesn't really matter because like you never really defeated it and like we're just going to pretend like that never happened and so you go back into the world and you still have that thing it always just (laughs) annoys me there, is there and, a least satisfying way for a game to end than yeah with the yeah hey you beat the game but if you want to keep playing you didn't really beat the game yeah which which like it's fine for some games like with zelda i was like oh with breath of the wild which was my first zelda game i was like oh 
this is really annoying. Like, I now have no real enthusiasm to keep going. But you know what? It's fine. I've done most of the game anyway. But with a farming game, the point of a farming game is, like, this routine and, like, this constant, like, I can spend hundreds of hours in this game. It's not really the same kind of thing. And I know lots of people did spend that sort of insane amount of time in Breath of the Wild, and that's fine, but... Yeah, it feels like more like farming games are meant to be that sort of game. Ah, oh, well. Uh, I've lost my show notes. The final... Autonauts. Piece? Yes, Autonauts. So they just announced that they have a physical release for Switch and PS4. Coming... Coming soon? No. Coming now. <laughs> now is soon. Uh, is now soon? Yes. Okay. Fine. <laughs> Let's not get into that argument then. Uh, uh, yeah so I mean if you've if you've played Autonauts and you love it you might want to get the physical release if you've not played it you probably won't want to get the physical release so that's fine I still haven't played it but I, I really do want to play it at some point it's on my list of games but that is a very long list and getting longer all the time okay that's all the news we are now going to talk about Disney Dreamlight Valley Ah, right. So I guess we'll do a quick overview of the game and then we'll probably get bogged down in a discussion about one of the particular mechanics. Um, So I guess a good way to describe this is it's a life sim game where you're playing as a character that has kind of dropped down into a, a world where, which was previously inhabited by all these Disney Pixar characters, Disney and Pixar characters. Um, but something has come over the world and there's like all this evil with like it, which is physically represented by thorns and your job is to get rid of all these to like get people's memories back and to bring them all back to the village and you know live in this village doing your standard life sim farming game things is that a good description yeah uh i i think so like i, I think on the on the spectrum of animal crossing to stardew valley it's much closer to the animal crossing end of the spectrum um but i think that's a a pretty good overview of um of what the game is i think i would agree with you it is closer to the animal crossing side of it but i think the far we'll obviously get into the discussions about the specific mechanics but the farming mechanic in particular is much more stardew valley than harvest uh, than animal crossing i agree it's much more detailed like Animal Crossing, it just feels like, oh, I guess w- let's eventually put in a farming mechanic in. And it's fine. It it, it it exists technically, you're farming stuff, but it doesn't really feel like a kind of core mechanic. Whereas this does feel like one of the like what, four or five main mechanics of the game. Yeah, and it um, it has the advantage of the, the farming in Dreamlight Valley is useful for other things. Whereas, you know, it's in Animal Crossing, you get like, some occasional crafting materials for like one or two items of furniture. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a much more core mechanic to this game than it is to to something like Animal Crossing. Um, but the I, I guess the overall vibe maybe of the game is much closer to an Animal Crossing vibe where um, it's much more about interacting with villagers and being part of the world and kind of running around and, and doing stuff rather than the um, stardew replicating sort of day-to-day life moving through seasons aspect yeah yeah so um i guess a couple of things that i've i've noticed like just kind of small mechanics things that we'll talk about before we kind of get into the details is um it does have um like real time time for a, no, no better way of saying that but like it, it runs like animal crossing to your your normal time like it's light when it's light and it's dark when it's dark um but it also, unlike Animal Crossing, has a stamina-based system. And when you run out of stamina, you don't go to sleep. You just have to go back to your house, which I think is an interesting way of doing things. Um, I like that you don't have to go to sleep. I'm, I can never, I never know whether I like stamina systems or not because it's like, oh, yeah, I get what you're doing. You're kind of adding in these kind of like negative things that mean that you can't just do everything all the time. But equally, like, why? Why do I have to? So I I thought a lot about the stamina system in this game in particular, and and I've landed on, I actually think it's a really helpful um, uh, thing to have, and it's because there's so much to do in each area, Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, rocks that you can mine, or fish that you run past that you could um, fish up, and there's just so much to do that 
having a stamina meter when you're trying to do something specific is a good way to keep you focused because you can't just run around doing everything you know if you if you're trying to move across the map and you were interacting with every interactable thing and there was no stamina meter (laughs) it would take you like two full hours just to get from one side to the other because it's I don't know if you're like me, but it's it's hard to run past resources that are sitting there, right? That you that you can collect on the way. It's just they're there, so you might as well collect them, right? Yeah, but maybe I want to do that, Johnny. <laughs> but uh, no, if you want to do if you want to do that, just no. This is this is a good game choice to keep the flow of the game going. Um, and I think it's one of those things. One of the underrated aspects of the stamina system and what it requires. It requires you to go back to your house, right? So it makes your yeah. your path deviate. Um, and in a world where you're trying to interact with a lot of these characters, sometimes you're running to your house, you're like, oh, this person has a new quest for me that I happen to run past, and um, it's satisfying in, in that sense. So I think the stamina system creates this like really uh, interesting sort of gameplay loop uh, that's not immediately obvious, and when you just sort of think about the stamina system, it's like, oh, well, it doesn't let me do everything, but it kind of forces the gameplay loop that I think is kind of crucial to this game being fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fair. And I guess the thing is, like, the map, if you ignore, um, like, the kind of the uh, expeditions part of it, which we'll we'll talk about later, um, the kind of main uh, vil- valley, I guess, is not humongous. Like, it's not tiny, um, but it's not like you're going to take, you know, 10 minutes to walk from one end back to your house. Like, you can get there pretty quickly and and re- refuel and then go back and you don't feel like you're you're constantly walking all the time yeah i don't know about you but um i haven't unlocked many of the fast travel points and the ones that i have unlocked i just never use them because everything is close enough that it's yeah it feels fine to just run between all of the different areas yeah 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 well, let's um just because we've we've touched on that i'm gonna shift the order of things about a little bit let's talk about the quest system because you were talking about you know stuff from the characters mm. and let me tell you i love this quest system like i love it to bits it does so many things that just sit so well with me so first of all your actual screen where it shows you all your quest systems does everything right so it's got like here's your here's a person it's it, so it, first of all each person has like two kinds of quests so there's either like st- things that can progress the story and then there's things that it is kind of asking you to do and it kind of splits the two in it out there which is is really nice because i like the fact that you can go oh i'm not really gonna kind of get into the story just now i just want to do some kind of like day-to-day stuff then you can see which quests are just like random things that you can do um and or or the other thing that I do quite a lot is like, no, I just want to get through some story. I don't want to deal with all the kind of side stuff just now. I just want to get through a bunch of story and you can kind of focus on those, which I really like. It also then shows you the quest per person, which I love as well. So like, you know exactly what you're looking for. You don't just have like a list of quests and you have to kind of go into it to see what the deal is and do I have the right stuff. But then it also does, it tells you what you need in the quests and on your inventory, it tells you when things in your inventory are needed for a quest. Like And these things all together, plus the fact that you can see above a character's head when they have a new quest and when you've already got everything ready for a quest, leads to the system where you've got so much you can do. And like, I've never felt like there are not enough quests. And this game is in early access, we should remind. There's so much more to this game to come. Like, it's not a finished game. But I already feel like there's loads to do. But it's also, I don't feel like I get lost in it because they have it so well structured. I am right there with you. The, to me, this is like the thing that this game does really well. And and it was to me that like, this is the point that sort of makes or breaks um, the game because it creates this really satisfying gameplay loop. And, and like you mentioned, it's laid out really well. It's really easy to know um, exactly what you should be doing. But I, I think the thing that it also does really well, and, and this is kind of, for me, the key part is this is a Disney game, right? You are interacting with Disney characters and yeah. uh, a lot of the stories feel um, that they really strike that balance between being true to the um, to the character that you're interacting with, but also pushing, you know, in new directions or unexplored ways, right? Because part of the appeal of this valley is you have characters from different worlds or different stories that are interacting with like one of my favorite like mini little quest lines is the the wally aerial interactions and and the the basis for their quests and it's just 
you wouldn't get that anywhere else. So they've they've stayed true to it, through that story. They stay true to who both of those characters are, but they find the common thread between them and then use that to generate a quest. Um, and you're not reading screens of dialogue, so you can pick up on that. You know, you can very quickly work out what are the things that I need to go and collect. It's very clearly laid out, and it's just really satisfying to go and complete. And almost on the way to completing it, at some point you pick up another quest, so there's kind of this constant churn of, I have something to do. I have something to um, to achieve that feels really satisfying. And, and I think that was the thing that ultimately sucked me into this game is like okay i've got the appeal from the disney characters um but a lot of you know sometimes when you're getting started with a a cottage core life sim farming game you can kind of get stuck if there isn't that obvious thing that you're supposed to do and i think that's what this game does really really well yeah definitely i mean the, the the character stuff is is really interesting like i feel like they could have gone wrong in two ways on this game one is it could have been all about the characters and they didn't really care about the gameplay and they could have just gone oh we have all the characters you guys love we don't really care about whether it's a fun game to play they could have done that and they didn't or they could have gone not really care about the characters that much and just go hey the faces will do it but like not actually kind of care too much about what they put into it but it's like even simple stuff like you know you were talking about like the wally stuff and then you've got um uh uh, what's his name? The Ratatouille rat. I can't remember his name. Remy. Remy. Um, Remy is the one that like it doesn't teach you cooking initially. You you get taught that um, in other ways, but like he's the one that lets you kind of advance that and get more more stuff to 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 do. Um, and that is is really nice. The fact that you've got these characters that are linked to something. They're not just random people telling telling you things. But also like one of the things I really noticed early on is if you go into Mickey's house. It really feels like a house that could be Mickey's. Like simple things like you've got his Fantasia outfit just sitting there. And you're like, I just love the fact that you've got this random... Sh- like, I, okay, I know that Fantasia isn't exactly a small um, film. You know, it's not like this random offbeat thing. But it's also not like a big... If you say, like, name a Disney film, you're not going to say Fantasia, right? Mm. But I love the fact that they've got his Fantasia costume in his house this random throwback from what 30 years ago of this one random thing where they they created this mickey is going to you know be in this um uh random musical thing and i just love those sorts of things all those little things and i feel like that's really present throughout the whole game is is a lot of those little nods and and it also makes me wonder a little bit about the audience that they targeted at because it feels very targeted towards um people that have grown up on disney right like uh, Mm -hmm. this game will appeal to children no doubt and and i think that's the smart thing is all of those little references are there for you know um uh parents or you know people that have just uh you know been into disney for a long time it feels like there are those rewards out there right and you get a lot of them through the daily interactions with the characters Mm -hmm. where you know you get to pick some of the options and even just like i'm surprised at some of the options and the things that you can say to the characters they go like you can be quite mean to some of the characters yeah (laughs) uh, if you want to which i was not expecting from a disney game i was expecting that to be like very protected you know you always you know you've got three options and all of them are like yes i absolutely want to do the thing and we're all great and aren't we all friends and like particularly when you interact with some of the the evil characters like you can call them out on a lot of stuff it's um and it's done in a way that's like it feels satisfying and some of the stories even are just like a little bit darker than I was, um, I guess I was expecting. And so it doesn't, to to me, this is sort of doing the thing that is, I think, a a problem with a lot of games where they overly focus on writing stories for children. Children don't Mm -hmm. care, right? Children are actually pretty smart. They'll kind of gloss through a lot of that stuff. And this is a way that you can do, do a game that will appeal to children. Like it's got the, the bright colors, the cool characters, the great stories. But th- there are those stories that if you're an adult and you actually understand what's going on, you're like, ooh, like that actually has some emotional weight to it. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually interesting. So there's a, um, an article on um, uh, Polygon that I'll, I'll have linked in the show notes where they are interviewing some of the developers of the game. And they talk about the the kind of the mean aspect of it. And actually, um, you know, the, that... Uh, 
the fact that they kind of deliberately put that in as like this is something we really want in the game um and the the point that they bring across is like ultimately you are there as the hero but like all heroes aren't the same right and you look at any disney or pixar thing it, yeah it's always clear who the good guy is but the good guy isn't always the same you know mm. like the good guy can be mean in some of these things like to differing differing levels and differing aspects but the whole point is like people are people and, and nobody's perfect and i really like the fact that you can have that personality and yeah as you say the fact that they've got they've not been too precious about this i, I would really love obviously they're not going to go too in depth into how you know they uh, uh is it game loft game loft i think or yeah, Gameloft, yeah. who are developing it. They're obviously not going to go too in detail about how they actually work with Disney. But you really feel like they've kind of set boundaries, but that's about it. And and kind of like, you have to stay true. And presumably they're going to, you know, Dis someone at Disney is going to be like approving all their kind of choices. They don't want to let something slip through. But it doesn't feel like they're kind of going, no, no, that, you can't do that. You can't do that. Like, it sounds like they are giving them a lot of free reign with this, which is really good. I totally agree. Yeah, it's um, uh, and it even comes through in the way the some of the characters are right. Like, and as you were saying that, I was thinking about the way they present um, Maui in the game, where he's very much you know still clearly you know a good guy and and the character from the movies, um, but he is very egotistical, right? He is very self centered as a character. Um, yeah. And those two things don't have to be like that. That is almost a trait that'd be very easy to put on to most villains. Um, mm -hmm. But it, and it's good to see that it's like, yeah, people can be this way and still be good people, right? It's um, and they that, may be and a little was, bit annoying. Yeah, oh yeah, and that was clearly his thing in 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 the film as well. Like you know, mm. you were you were meant to kind of have that mixed feelings towards him. You know, like from the very moment you, you, the first thing he does when, when we meet him in the film is sing a song about him and how great he is, <laughs> you know, like yeah. he starts that off. But we also know that ultimately he is going to have to help in this story and maybe not be the ultimate hero, right? That's, that's clearly Moana in the film, but he still has to be one of the good guys. Um, yeah, exactly. So I, I feel all of the characters are pretty good, except for um, Merlin, right? And, and Merlin is kind of the character that, that almost exists as the tutorial in the game. Yeah. Um, but I just don't get any strong sense of Merlin as a character. He kind of just feels like mm. this. We don't really know who should solve this problem or what should be done. So it kind of all just Merlin is like this weird filter for the game. That's probably yeah. my only down from a, uh, the sort of quest story progression perspective. I have, I do have one more, and it, it possibly isn't an actual issue with the character, but more my personal issues with the character, and that is uh, Scrooge McDuck. I, I don't understand whether Scrooge McDuck is actually rich or not, but I feel like he's either lying about his wealth, or the reason he's rich is because I keep giving him money. <laughs> yeah, his yeah, that, that, that that's fair. His character is. Uh... Uh, a little all over the shop because he, he comes across like always desperate for for money yeah um in a way that's not particularly endearing <laughs> the first thing he does is say hey i need you to help me because I, I you know i need you to 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 buy this thing and i'm like dude aren't you rich aren't you a billionaire like why do you need my money like i yeah. have to pay to upgrade his shop yeah that's uh th that's one of the <laughs> that the upgrade mechanic entirely being based around money in the game is um i get it right it's it's kind of easy to do and and money as a central currency is good um or, or is is relatively straightforward but it doesn't feel particularly satisfying i think that's probably my least favorite aspect of the game is sort of the the upgrade path and it's sort of centering around money and i i think that's because it doesn't sort of build off of the relationships that you build with the characters um you know mm. when you get the the houses and the shops it's like i can um go and become really good friends with remy but he's not going to expand to the restaurant because i still haven't mm. you know paid scrooge mcduck ten thousand dollars to make it bigger <laughs> Yeah, I feel like they probably could do something more around the kind of friendship with the characters. But I also like how you don't have to forage a bunch of random things to upgrade these shops. Like the fact that I can just get the money, which is the thing that I care about <laughs> as well, and just pay to upgrade it, especially my house, you know, that I like 
because so many of these things are just going, oh, well, you need 10 or random bits of wood and you need, it's like, can I not just give me the money and you just, you just do the thing, you know? How do you have so much money in this game though? I find I'm constantly, <laughs> constantly uh, have no money because I'm just paying to upgrade everything all the time. Like it's just, uh, uh, th- that is my real bottleneck. I, I, I want the building materials. I'll go collect more building materials if I can have it now. <laughs> see, see, I would, I would, prefer to spend the time to farm to get the money to then do it rather than foraging random things but i guess that's just different ways of playing mm. Shall we talk speaking about of farming, farming. <laughs> yeah so this as we said is kind of a much more kind of in-depth farming than your animal crossing farming um it, it's probably not quite as detailed as your your stardew or story of seasons but it's still i think it's still pretty good you've got a wide selection of crops and the so so it's kind of your standard farming in that you prepare the ground, you plant, you water, it grows, you harvest, right? It's kind of standard. But they've done a couple of things that I really like that make the process so much nicer. So simple things like if you have um, like a, a large number of one, one seed, what you can do is you can hold the button down when you plant one and it will just keep going down the line and planting until you get to the end. And the same with watering, you can like do that all the way down. And I love that that kind of automation. So it's like, I'm still doing the thing. My character's still doing everything they need to do, but I can just sit and hold the button while they go down the line. I really like that. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of it. And I, one of the things I like is it works with um, square patterns as well. Like when your character reaches the end of a row, they automatically will just move over a row, turn around and go back the other way. So if you've got, you know, your um, five by five box that you want to use for farming, you can plant that whole thing with just one hold of the button. It's um, very satisfying. Works for harvesting as well, which is nice. Um, yeah. yeah I, I think it's a really smart form of automation in this game, right? Because it's not designed to have a permanently laid out farming plot with water, you know, with sprinklers and that sort of stuff. It's, it's not, that's not the, um, yeah. the vibe that they're going for. So I think this is a really smart way of implementing it. And I think just a, a general comment on a lot of the sort of, farming base mechanics or the you know the the cottage core style mechanics is it feels like the developers of this game played a lot of um different farming games and looked at lots of different implementations and understood what makes those systems fun and designed new things off the back of that that works for the world that they've created yeah yeah definitely um i will say i've had a couple of issues with um the the automated farming going round corners um i don't know if that's kind of just some bugs because we're in early access or whether it's because of the weird system that i'm using so i should probably uh, interact uh, uh, interrupt now and say that the way that i'm playing this game is very weird so i'm playing it on uh game pass because i don't want to pay for a game that's going to be an early access and i have game pass so i thought i'd play it through game pass but i also don't want to play it on a laptop or anything so i'm playing it on my steam deck but of course the only way you can play game pass games on the steam deck just now is through cloud gaming so I'm playing it through cloud gaming on my Steam Deck, which does work for most things, but it's possible that some there's something weird that's causing like this uh, bug with the, the, the automated farming. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm playing on um, Xbox through Game Pass, and it, it can be a bit laggy from time to time, but I don't think I've experienced quite what um, quite what you've said. For the most part, it's been pretty good. Yeah, well, I mean, in general, it's, it's really good. Like... Um, just as an aside, like the cloud gaming works really well and I'm surprised with how well it works. But um, yeah, sometimes you do get, it's just like I'll be running around and then suddenly it goes like, there's like a drop in frames um, and uh, you know, I turn around and everything just goes like pixelated, which is just a bit funny, but it doesn't happen very often, but it is funny when it does happen. Yeah. I think the other thing that I really like about the farming is, um, I don't know what to call it, but you'll, uh, very infrequently get a crop that um, when you harvest it, it doesn't go away and you've got like maybe 10 seconds where you can just mash A repeatedly and get as much out of it. And it's just one of those little exciting things. Like anytime it happens and you're moving past, you're like, oh, got to run back like and, and just mashing A and you get a whole bunch of stuff out of it. It's such a feel-good mechanic that doesn't really yeah. break the economy of the game. It doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't feel like one of those things you can force. And it's just exciting every time it happens even though, like, nothing, the result of it isn't amazing, right? You're just getting more of this thing that you're yeah. already farming a lot of anyway. But it's just so satisfying. Yeah, it's kind of like how in, you know, Stardew and uh, other games like that, you can sometimes get, like, a, a, 
like a quadruple sized one and it's like mm. really rare to happen but when it does happen it's really satisfying yeah that's a that's a good analogy um although i guess you don't feel as bad about harvesting these ones because that, that was always my problem with the large <laughs> crops in in the stardew it's like i don't want to harvest this because it's like it's almost like the trophy that you're leaving out there um <laughs> yeah the problem there is it dies at the end of the season exactly um is there, is there anything else to talk about farming? It, it's a good system. I like it. I, I'm sure, um, you know, it'll kind of change as, as we go on. So that's another thing to point out is remember anything we talk about could change between now and when you play it because this is all early access. And um, I think that's actually going off on a tangent here. I've seen them talk a lot about uh, improvements they're making because of people's feedback, which is is really good as well. Like I've seen multiple tweets from them saying, oh, we noticed people are having issues with this. We're working on a fix for that. That That is really good. They're, they're, they're working with the community and exactly how they should during early access. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Um, I don't have anything more specifically on farming, except for um, maybe if we talk a little bit about cooking. Um, and I don't think yep. it needs to be a long discussion, but I think the cooking system in, um, in this game is really good, right? So they uh, break down... Uh, all of the ingredients into I think there's five or six different categories um, and recipes um, so you find recipes like in the world or as you're progressing through the story and some recipes will say you know they'll require something specific so like a salad you know uh, might require a lettuce and then it might require you know one of anything else from the vegetable category and I think yeah. the thing that it does really well is the the system is set up to encourage experimentation um, I remember very early on in the game, I was like, oh, I wonder if I can make an apple pie. And so I got uh, an apple and some wheat and some butter, and I made an apple pie, right? And, and it was really yeah. satisfying when you have the idea of, I wonder if this will make this thing, and it does. Um, I've been very impressed with the system so far. Yeah, I think this I think this is a perfect case of, like, takes the things from other farming games that are good. Um, I don't think it does anything new. I think all of the things that it does are things I have seen in other games, but it's the first one that's kind of put them all together. So as you say, the kind of like categories of of, of items, meaning that you can decide which one you want to put in is really nice. Uh, the, um, the aspect of you don't need a recipe, you can try and figure out a recipe. I always love that. I hate when it's just like, oh, these are what you can make and that's it. And thirdly is the kind of automatic, like, I don't really care what I'm doing with this. Just I click a button. I just want this thing just autofill with whatever I have in my inventory is also really nice. Like these things together make a really nice, uh, so you, you've got the people who really want to kind of delve in and be really specific about what they're far, uh, cooking to the ones that are just like, you know what? I just want something to eat. I want to, I want to re- increase my stamina when I'm out. That's all I care about. Um, I love that what they've done there. Me too. Um, cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, there's an aspect in the game, as I mentioned, where kind of the town has been kind of taken over by like an, uh, an evil, I don't want to sp- talk too much about the story, um, as with always in these games, but it's kind of been taken over by essentially what is like thorns. Um, and you kind of come to the village and you are f- shock surprise you are the one who can help get rid of these thorns imagine that who would have expected very disney trope um (laughs) um, and so one of the things you can do around the town is is going up to these thorns and getting rid of them but there's loads of other kind of like small uh what's the word i'm looking for kind of resource gathering things like there's rocks and there's um plants that grow and and stuff like that and there's spots you can dig mushrooms um I don't, I don't know if there's anything much to say about these other than just like it has quite a large number of these things that I've put together. Again, kind of like the cooking where I don't think any of them are new, but it puts them all together reasonably well. I like the kind of the, the mining. I like the digging. They work pretty well. Although I will say one thing about the digging. I really hate the fact that they have two different... Uh, so, so if you're... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's... Uh, like if you're standing, you have like a focus on the ground. Um, so if you want to like pick up something or farm or something like that. With digging and with farming, watering, that sort of stuff, it doesn't replace the focus that you have on the ground. It gives you a second focus. Yeah. But the problem with that is they can get out of sync. 
And that can be confusing because it shows both of them as well. So if you're walking along digging and you have it just slightly out, so it's actually on the one like left to you rather than in front of you, but your normal focus is on the one in front of you, I get confused and I think the focus is on the wrong one. So I dig and then I dig the wrong one. And, I, and that I find annoying. I really feel like they need to make those focus the same thing. Yeah, and I think um, uh, on the digging specifically, dig digging is kind of the most frustrating form of resource gathering. So um, from digging, you get things like clay and um, dirt and all those sorts of things. And, and some of the quests, particularly in the late game, require a lot of those resources. And there's no um, real explicit way to sort of go in and farm them. Um, so, mm. so they got a bit annoying and then, you know, compounded by the... Um, the problems that you mentioned about sort of the spot that you're digging in and how that whole system works, it's um, it was a little frustrating. Um, although I think one of the things that um, we haven't talked about yet that this game does really well um, is sort of as part of the buddy system or, or the friend system, when you get to level two with any of the characters, you can assign them a specialization. Um, so it might be yeah. fishing or digging or whatever it is. And then um, uh, if you get them, you know, if they buddy up and, and they follow you around, um, whenever you're doing that task, they will produce extra of those resources for you, which is really nice because it, it A, makes resource gathering faster and it levels up your, your friendship with that character as well. So it's, it's, again, just one of those really satisfying, you know, uh, solving multiple problems in a way that's um, uh, pretty elegant and, and I really like that system. Yeah, that's true. And and definitely the the issues that I've brought up are, are like things that you kind of expect in an early access. And if you're not expecting them, don't play an early access. Like these are things that can and probably will, based on what I'm seeing with them around other things, probably will be fixed. Um, it's just like, you know, I can see how you, you kind of miss these things if you have like quite a small group of initial testers and this larger group with the early access will, will help things. Yeah, and I think that's part of the early access, right, is I feel like with particularly some of the later game quests is they're really trying to um, maybe push the limits of, you know, finding out what is a, a reasonable number to collect of this resource, like how, how far is too far, right, because you want some of that, you know, hey, we're, we're later in the game, you know, yeah. make me make me work for this, um, but there's a, a limit to that, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so the other thing around the the thorns is that like as you do things in the game, like lots of different things, you gain. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. Is it just Dreamlight? Is it just Dreamlight? Is that what it's called? Uh yeah, I can't remember the name of that currency. I think it is Dreamlight. It might just be Dreamlight, and that would explain the name of the game. Um, yeah. You gain this as you go, and um, there are like areas of the game that you can't just like that are covered in thorns that you can't just get rid of. You can't just like go up and get rid of them like you can the the normal ones around the village. Um, but as you gain more of the streamlight, you can then go and unlock these other areas. Like once you get to like ten thousand, you can unlock the castle, and then you can unlock different areas, um, and progresses into other areas, um. And you get like the dreamlight for loads of things. I actually really like the um, the this. It's almost like uh, achievements you can get for unlocking these things. So it's like, oh, you've harvested ten things. Here's some dreamlight, and then oh, you've harvested a hundred things. Here's some more dreamlight, and so like there's loads of things for like you know breaking rocks and talking to people and making higher friendship levels and buying things and selling things and all these things have different levels of these. Um, achievements that unlock more dreamlight yeah it's it's super satisfying and it's one of those things that adds to the uh, the momentum of the game right because as you're doing quests and you're leveling up with friends and then you're getting you know these small achievements that are ticking over and increasing your dreamlight it just creates this really nice momentum and, and i think even one of the things you know in order to collect the dreamlight you have to go into the system that shows these achievements so you can kind of get a sense of like oh i'm really close to you know uh i've got to just harvest three more potatoes and then i'll get this next one so maybe i'll go and plant some potatoes and it just creates that really nice yeah. uh momentum of of things to do yeah definitely definitely have you got the have you got the fishing one it has a it has a uh, a fishing um, without failing one. Have you have you got that one? Uh, I don't think so. You have to, you have to get to a hundred for the highest level, and oh it's nowhere near as bad as the um as the Animal Crossing one. Let's mostly because the fishing, fishing in this game is then. much better. <laughs> we can't we can't not talk about the fishing mini game, can we? I... No, we definitely cannot. <laughs> I think I like it, but I really hated figuring it out in the first place. I know the I know that Goofy tells you how to do it, 
But I, it took me legitimately 15 minutes to successfully do one because I had no idea what he was trying to <laughs> tell me to do. And I don't know why I struggled so much. That is fascinating. I love this fishing mechanic. To me, this is the best fishing mechanic that has been in a cottagecore game. I think it's simple. Maybe maybe I listened to Goofy, um, and so I knew exactly what I was supposed <laughs> wow. to be doing, and it, wow. it, it works. <laughs> I do think probably a part of it is that I wasn't listening, but um, still. <laughs> look, I shouldn't have to read text in the game to understand how it works, all right? Look, I, I, look, I, I want to say, I feel like even without reading the text, it's, I feel like it's straightforward. So part of the problem was that I kept pressing it before the green circle appeared. Ah, uh, okay. So... So my problem is, I think it's because, like, my automatic reaction for so many of these games is, as soon as the bubbles, like, appear, you press it, because that's the time to catch it. Yeah. So, like, even though I kind of knew in my head I wasn't meant to be doing it, the muscle memory kicked in, and I would just press it, and then it would fail, and it was really annoying. Yeah, I, I, if you just, I definitely If you just wait that few... one second, the circle appears, and then you know, oh, I just need to press it when it's green. Yes. Yeah, I definitely failed a few times at the start because you're like overly twitchy and, and wanting to respond quickly and it's almost a fishing system that requires a little bit of patience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm as enthusiastic as you are. It, it's fine. Like, I don't know. It's, it's not I, I will say a lot, of, a lot of my enthusiasm comes from the fact that I think uh, most farming games would be better if they didn't have fishing. I, f I find fishing to very huh. commonly be the worst implemented mechanic. I'd never find it fun. And I think for me, this is just like easy enough that it's like, it, it doesn't need to occupy a large portion of my brain space in terms of playing the game. Um, there's not tons of fish. There's there's not that many. It was pretty easy to complete the complexion, uh, the, the, the co collection log for them. Um, so it was almost like ticked to the box for me because it's a kind of doesn't make itself too present in the game yeah yeah that's that's fair that's fair uh so we were talking about the the kind of unlocking of areas based on the thorns i guess i again we don't want to talk about the story too much so we're not going to talk about spoilers um but i think it's probably important to kind of vaguely touch on the expeditions so one of the things you unlock really early on is a castle that has like gateways to essentially what is the like in in film or tv world where these characters are what we think of as from right but obviously within the game yeah, they're they're from right? where they're from this valley um and your kind of job is to kind of go there and convince them to come back so that they can get their memories back essentially yeah i i kind of have mixed feelings about this like it is nice to go into their home world and to you know recruit them from there and to you know help them out with a small task but um it also does suffer from a little bit that there's there's going to need to be so many of these home worlds that they create um that they can't really over invest in in making them um uh quite you know large and interactive and um, even the the frozen one, which is um, by far the largest of them, um, they're kind of not. They're just not that exciting. I don't think. Um, I, I yeah. think I almost preferred the ones that were like get in, get out, get the get the person. Um, and I would like for them to be more in depth. But equally, I understand why it's not valuable to go in and actually make them much more in depth than they are. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think uh, you know I like to think of them as just like. Uh kind of just an an extra little nicety rather than like they're not a whole new kind of part of the game it's it, it feels it feels a bit funny to say this but it's almost just a way to kind of get you mentally closer to the characters in terms of like not in the game obviously but you personally to feel closer to the characters which uh, feels silly because like the whole point of this game is because you're already close to the characters but uh, <laughs> So I've never seen Ratatouille, right? Because I've just never bothered to watch it. But I, but obviously I'm playing this game not for Remy, but for the other characters. And the fact that I go and find him in the kitchen and kind of get to know him a little bit that way before bringing him back, I think makes me feel closer to him. And I, I definitely get it's not really built up. It's not like huge and it's quite short. But you do at least get something there before you bring them back and have to kind of bond with them in the valley. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. And I, and I feel like I'm supposed to be offended on behalf of, you know, 
the the mega Disney fans out there that you haven't seen Ratatouille, but um, Ratatouille sucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, so, so, so don't watch that. But I, I think it's a good point about those worlds, right? It's just having that little mental connection to mm-hmm. the character, that familiar world, so that they're, they're not just like some, you know, random character that's just appearing in this valley with no connection. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, so we talked a bit about the kind of upgrading. Um, is there anything else we want to touch up on that about the house and the shops and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, I, I think I've got two things. Is is one is there's okay. the second form of automation. So there's the um, greenhouse that that Wally does that sort of produces some farming crops every day, and mm-hmm. Moana has a fishing boat where she goes and collects fish every day. Again, I think this is just a really nice form of automation. Um, you know, that, that will kind of provide enough resources if the farming or the fishing doesn't particularly grab you, uh, but you still want to collect those things or you need them to give to people or to make dishes or progress the story, whatever it is, you've kind of got that way to get it that you just don't have to go and do that thing a lot if you're not interested in it. So I think that's really yeah. a smart form of automation. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's fair. Uh, the, the other thing um, from an upgrading perspective is, so you put houses down for um, all of the people that move in, and I really like the houses, right? The houses really evoke the, the characters that they're, that they're there for. I just don't feel they fit into the world particularly well. <laughs> they feel like a lot of the buildings in the valley feel sort of big and boxy and, and almost a little bit out of place, and, you know, you've got the ones that go in the water for um, characters like maui and ursula and and those sorts of ones and and they just i don't feel like they fit into the world that well i kind of wish there was just that maybe they were a little bit smaller or I, i'm not sure but i don't i don't love the aesthetic of the houses the outside of the houses in the world yeah interesting i think you you're a lot further on in the game than i am so um it's possible i've just kind of not i've, I've not unlocked a huge number of characters um I mean, I only started playing it two weeks ago and then the last week has been crazy. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think that's, I've not really noticed that, but that, that might just be, I've not got through as far as you. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I didn't notice it. Um, uh, I guess for reference of, I've, I've unlocked every character that's available in the game and done, I've done pretty much all of the content that is available in the game at the moment. Um, and yeah, it's definitely just once the world starts filling up and, and you think about the the future of this game and, and the, you know, at the moment I think there's 17 characters in the game um, and you think about the scope of Disney and, and you could very easily imagine uh, 50 or 60 characters by the time this game is um, yeah. really up and churning that um, I guess I just, I wonder how all of these things would fit together in a way that is aesthetically pleasing, right? Because that's a big thing for me in any of these games yeah. is yeah. I want my village to feel and look nice. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. That's a very good point. I, it, it'll be interesting to see, just as you talk about the future, I wonder if they'll ever push past the standard Disney Pixar characters or whether they will stick to that. Like, Because Disney own so much now. Like, Will they do some Marvel stuff? Or will they do some Star Wars stuff? I don't know. I'm not saying they should. It's an interesting question. I I, I don't I, feel like they would fit, but... Yeah, I, I would be pretty opposed to that. Like, I feel like a huge part of the charm of this game is... Um, uh, when, when we talked before, right, you know, Disney characters have different personalities, but ultimately they're almost recognisable as Disney characters um, in a way that, like, Iron Man is not a recognisable Disney character. So... yeah. I, I'm not particularly invested in seeing Iron Man and Ariel have a conversation in the same way <laughs> that it is interesting to um, see how, you know, Ursula and Kristoff from Frozen are going to interact, right? To me, that's way more yeah. compelling than characters from these totally, th- th- these two pieces of meter that, that have a different feeling attached to them. Yeah, no, that's fair. Maybe they just need to do a, a, like take the game and just strip out all the characters and put in new characters for marvel stuff because <laughs> let's be honest yeah. right you know you'd play that yeah i would <laughs> <laughs> very easily yeah <laughs> um just before we go on to the next bit is there anything else mechanics wise that you want to chat mechanics or story wise you want to chat about uh, I'll stay away from any spoilers from from the story perspective um but i guess i just wasn't expecting um 
uh, the direction that they were going to take some of the stories and the... Uh, I guess I just wasn't expecting the stories to be any good. And I think the stories <laughs> are just kind of like... They're, they're just good. And they shouldn't be... And it's kind of like a, a little microcosm of how I feel about this whole game. Where it just shouldn't be good. But the stories are, for the most part, pretty damn excellent. It kind of found, sounds a bit ridiculous when you say you weren't expecting something Disney slash Pixar to be a good story. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I get, guess I, I get just, where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, I was just expecting them to rely on the the, the tropes of the characters and to not yeah. put that much thought into it. And I guess that's the thing that shocks me about this game in general is the amount of thought that has clearly gone into it is uh, astounding, right? And and this is almost like the expectation for that I have for every game is that you think about things this much, but when games are relying on existing IP, that's often the first thing that they throw out the window, right? Because they're like, just get something out. It doesn't have to be good. Just get it out. People will play it, right? I feel like all of the thought that they've put in, just to me, it speaks to uh, what I assume must be love and passion from the developers because it's not going to have much impact in terms of sales um, or, or the financial yeah. success of this game because that's all based on the fact that this is Disney, um well i think yeah. kind of but they're also it's it's going to be a free-to-play game right so presumably there'll be like uh in in in-game stuff that you can purchase which i haven't noticed anything at this point there, there is a menu uh which i haven't looked <laughs> too much into because it doesn't seem like there is much but there is some additional form of currency that looks like a a paid currency but that menu right, okay. feels very bare bones and yeah um yeah but Probably I, the I reason not this game costs it. money just now. <laughs> yes. But my point being, um, because it's a free-to-play game, they rely on people continuing to play it and therefore continuing to buy stuff and therefore it needs to be good. Does it need to be good, though? People just love Disney well, so fair. much that they will just buy it. You know, they will put money into it just to get the Disney stuff, right? I feel like that is... Yeah. Most of most of the people that will put money into this game are, are not going to be the user bees. It's going to be the people that are just Disney obsessed, right? Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. Cool. Well, you mentioned just uh, I quickly want to chat about. You mentioned uh, there's obviously upcoming updates, um, and it is early access, and there's a lot of stuff. Apparently, if you look in the Polygon article, there's a lot of stuff that's upcoming. They have just announced that the next update is coming out when you're hearing this today so the 19th of october um and uh that has a bunch of new stuff including apparently scar who according to the developers um when they add scar into the game um it will add chaos to the game so it'll be interesting to see how that actually changes things i am excited for that yeah it's interesting because he's he's not the first villain in the game so i wonder why scar in particular is going to make such a big difference I think the um, the existing villains uh, both have magical backgrounds, so they're kind of, you know, uh, they have a thing that they can contribute to the overall valley, you know, even if they're maybe more pursuing their own ends than the ends of the valley. Whereas Scar is just kind of evil, right? Like, they're, uh, I, I, he, there's nothing obvious that he's going to add that could be a positive to the valley. So, I, yeah, I'm interested to see how they handle that. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. It will be interesting to see. We don't obviously have much to talk about that but just now, but uh, maybe at some point we'll talk about it again. After uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do the Animal Crossing of having an episode talking about every single update. Like, don't have time for that. But maybe we'll, maybe we'll have another conversation about this game when there's uh, a bunch of new updates. We'll, we'll see how things go. Uh, so I guess like, conclusion. Um, I feel like my conclusion is exactly what i said at the beginning the game shouldn't be good but it is and i'm i'm a little bit annoyed with how good it is because i'm gonna have to keep playing this game i am right there with you right like i just <laughs> uh, when a friend told me that this game had come out and suggested that i play it you know we played animal crossing together all of those sorts of things i was just expecting i'll download this i'll play this for an hour or two to you know say yep i tried it and it wasn't for me and it, it was for me like it's it's just a great game i don't know that i could recommend someone pay the full 60 or 70 dollars dollars for it um just yet like I, I think part of the you know appeal at the moment is that it is a game pass game and so it's easy enough to look over some of the 
you know, the early access bugs and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. But if it keeps going on this traje- trajectory, it'll be a really easy game for me to recommend it at a full price. Yeah, I think uh, probably important to note that you can actually get it for like 30 quid. It's not as expensive. It, they, there are like three different levels you can do and the higher levels just get you more uh, in-game content, like uh, clothes and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, the, your fair point. Um, although obviously when they have said that when this comes out of our, it comes out of early access, it will be free to play as well. So um, that makes it even easier to uh, recommend to people. Yeah, assuming they don't add um, uh, microtransaction hell to the game, um, this I will think be that'll a be pretty key. easy. Re- yeah, that that could either that that could destroy the game if they make it really bad. Uh, and I guess you you've got to think they've got a whole team figuring out what it is exactly they're going to do, and hopefully they know that they could kill it if they don't do it well. I mean, it feels like with with what I feel in the mechanics and, and everything they've implemented today, I feel like there's a lot of passion from the developers. So uh, yeah. I would either be shocked or expecting, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, some developers to then leave the studio and to come out with the, you know, large corporation forced us to put in this microtransaction thing, but it wasn't our vision for the game. So uh, yeah, we, we will just... see what progresses on that front. I've seen so many games be ruined by it, like where the game is otherwise great. Um, and then it just ends up being rubbish because of microtransactions, but I guess we'll see. Anything else you want to say about this before we finish off? No, it's awesome. Play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well that's the thing. I was going to say, we normally ask whether we would recommend it, but there, I, there we go. I think we've uh, recommended it. Um, obviously, you have to go into it, bearing in mind it's an early access game. So um, I know that some people don't like doing early access games because they like to play a game when it's full and complete whatever that means but you know you know who you are what you want to play so well thank you johnny for joining me thanks for having me it's been fun yes it has been good uh where can people find you on the internet uh not on twitter i don't have twitter delete your twitter and come join us on the patreon uh cool you can find me on twitter at the scott bot i am on twitter i talk nonsense on twitter come and join me talking nonsense um you can follow the podcast on twitter at ths pod um where i you, that's the way you get up to date farming game news this is not for up to date farming game news this is for slightly late farming game news um if you do want to join us on the patreon you can do that through the link on the website harvestseason.club um has links to other things as well um on the patreon we have a number of things including a, a bonus podcast called the greenhouse on the next episode of the greenhouse we'll be talking to johnny about johnny my favorite topic <laughs> um i think that's everything thank you again for joining me thank you thank you listeners for listening and until next time Have a good good harvest. The Harvest Season is created by Rochelle Delaney and Al McKinley, with support from our pro farmer level patrons, Kevin and Stuart. Our art is done by Micah the Brave, and our music is done by Nick Burgess. Feel free to visit our website, harvestseason.club, for show notes and links to things we discussed in this episode. Thanks for listening. And please excuse any uh, fits of coughing I have. I will just edit them out. But, uh, no, all good, because I'm suspecting it will be this. It's happening when I laugh. So, like, I laugh and then <laughs> suddenly go into a fit of coughing. So don't be funny, is what I'm saying. Uh, well, I'm an expert at that, so we're all good. <laughs>